Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, to those of you that are home watching, um, a very welcome. Today is the Lord's Day, and uh, we're excited about that. Primarily because we get to turn our attention from all the craziness that is in the world, all the busyness in our schedules, and give our attention to our Lord because He is worthy of that. Um, in this hour, we're going to give our attention to uh, the book of Daniel as we started, um, I think about a couple of months ago. Um, we, today, we're going to be able to return to the actual text uh, of Daniel. Uh, today, we're looking at Daniel chapter 3. Uh, we've looked at the first two, um, two chapters. Uh, because of the brevity of time, I would not recap all of that except to say that if you, if today's the first time you're tuning in, you might want to go back uh, to those previous videos. Um, they're all uploaded on YouTube and uh, we trust that it will be a blessing to you. Uh, so let's open in a word of prayer, dive into the text, and then um, we can uh, look at the actual text. Okay, let's pray. Our love and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for all that you keep doing for us. Thank you for the gift of life that you have freely bestowed to each and every one of us. We thank you for your Son Jesus and for his finished work on our behalf. And by virtue of that finished work, we, as your people, saved only by grace, uh, are gathered here uh, to worship you and to give you the adoration that you alone deserve. Amongst other things, we want to give consideration to your word. And so we ask that Holy Spirit, that you would open the eyes of our understanding as we delve into the book of Daniel once again. Enable us to behold wondrous things in your law. May your truths be made alive in our own lives. And may we be given grace to be able to not just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word as we await your return. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. I ask that you would give me uh, grace to be able to express the truth of your word in a way that is clear, succinct, and understandable to your people. May it answer every question that they, they would have, and may it be a blessing to each and every one of us. Thank you once again for having had our prayer as always. And it's in Christ's precious name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Okay, so... Uh, thank you again for tuning in. Uh, we're going to delve into the text of Daniel chapter 3. There are 30 verses. My aim and goal is to be able to go through um, the entirety of the chapter, which is a Herculean task. Um, that implies that we are not going to turn every stone as we look in this chapter. It's going to be um, very carefully is going to give us a big picture of this chapter. What is the main message? What are some of the truths that we can draw from that? And uh, again, we're trusting that that will be a blessing to all of us. Okay. So Daniel chapter 3, verse 1, it reads, that Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the province, provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald, then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you, the commanders given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that the moment that you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, at that time when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, uh, backpipe and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image 
that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, fruit, lie, dragon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then the book of Nezah, in rage and anger orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. The book of Nezah responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the moment, you hear the sound of the horn, fruit, light, track on Southry and bagpipe, and all kinds of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And the God, and what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath and his facial expression was altered to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered by giving orders to, the, to heat the furnace seven times more than it, usually, than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them in the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, um, and their clothes and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the, of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell in the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, Was it not three men that were cast into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. In verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship the God except their own God. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Finally, in verse 30, then the king called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. Very interesting story. Very, very interesting. Um, there's a lot going on. But again, it's very fascinating. Having looked at chapter 1, right, where these men, um, these Jews have been taken away from their home, uh, their, home have been, their homes have been destroyed. They've been carried to a foreign land. Their language, they've been taught a foreign language. Um, their history and, and tradition has been sort of eradicated. Um, the food that they're eating, is, their diet has changed. 
everything about these men um, has been radically changed. Uh, and yet we see again in chapter 1, God given these men, Daniel, Shadrach, and Abednego, given them favor in Babylon in the face of the king. Uh, fast forward to chapter 3, we have confronted with uh, these similar characters, Daniel, uh, we're correct, uh, sorry, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and King Nebuchadnezzar. Right, there is a logical connection between the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream in chapter 2 and the image that he had built on the plain of Dura in chapter 3. The, there is a logical connection between these two, um, these two images. Perhaps he got the idea for the statue he built from the statue he saw in his dream. Perhaps. He somehow had forgotten, Nebuchadnezzar had somehow forgotten. However, the lesson that he had learned about Yahweh's sovereignty in the previous chapter, evidently he thought of his position as the head of gold perhaps had made him proud you remember how in daniel chapter 2 i think if you study it daniel tells him you are the head of gold your kingdom is unique it's most powerful god has given you power he's given you strength he's given you might he's given you glory these things were the pronouncements of yahweh to nebuchadnezzar from daniel in his presence and he had these things and we're saying, you know, perhaps there is an indication that these things have been had, um, Nebuchadnezzar having had these things may have been filled with pride because we don't see a change in character and attitude in the life of this man in chapter 3. We know that this chapter describes events that followed those in chapter 2 because in chapter 3 we see Daniel's three friends had assumed their positions of administrative leadership that was where we ended in chapter 2. Um, how much later is unclear, though it seems possible that several years may have elapsed. And so there are six major points if we're going to be able to finish the entire chapter that I want us to give consideration to. The first of which is the worship of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, uh, as we see in verses 1 through 7. Uh, in verse 1, the image, the whole image that the king built was of gold. The head of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream was also of gold. Daniel had told him that he was the head of gold, but that he would be followed by another kingdom inferior to his. That kingdom was going to be made of silver. Rejecting now the idea that any kingdom could follow his own, he may have determined to show the permanence of his golden kingdom by having the entire image covered with gold. This image stood about 99 feet and nine feet wide 99 feet high and nine feet wide that is huge this is the height of a 10-story building and the width of a nine feet by 12 feet room so that the image was really huge this morning as i was making my way to church we live in the in the story building we live on the seventh floor uh, i think there are 21 floors and I was just looking at where we were from the bottom to the seventh itself. It's, it's tall to think that this is 99 feet tall. It's incredible. We do not know what the image represented, but in view of Nebuchadnezzar's extraordinary ego, right? The image uh, may have been a likeness of him. There's no evidence to that in the text. But it's possible. However, there's no evidence, like I said, that the Mesopotamians ever worshipped statues of their rulers as divine rulers during their lifetime. Right? Some writers have suggested that the image may have resembled an obelisk similar to those found in Egypt. It is likely that the image represented Nebuchadnezzar's patron god, Nebo. Um, again, the text doesn't tell us what this image was like the one we saw in chapter 2. The, the one in chapter 2 tells us that it was this image of a human, you know, has a head of gold, it has a chest of silver, you know, all of that. Uh, in chapter 3, this image that Nebuchadnezzar built, we're not told what image exactly it was. Going on then, Nebuchadnezzar summoned his officials, so he's built this image, and now he's called for his officials um, so that he can be able to dedicate this image. His officials to the image for what he probably intended 
to be a demonstration of loyalty to him the religious connotation of the gathering is unclear all we're told in the text is that they were he assembled them in order to dedicate this image they regarded as an act of hostility against the kingdom and its monarch while everyone might at the same time honor his own national god now this acknowledgement that the gods of the kingdom were the more powerful every heathen could grant right because the babylonian kingdom was was a polytheistic society they didn't hold to one god and as Nebuchadnezzar demanded nothing in a religious point of view which every one of his subjects could not yield to him therefore right the refusal of the jews could not but appear as an opposition to the greatness of his kingdom um in verse 3 the author informs us of the details of these officials he names them the satraps the prefects and he also tells us what the purpose was for which these officials had been guarded it was for the dedication of the image that the king had made we just alluded to that so then going on in verse 4 these officials therefore declared to the people of the kingdom both natives and captives what they were to do so Nebuchadnezzar has built this image huge image one that was of gold the entire image was of gold then he calls on his officials uh, his his you know his satraps his prefects all of these people with the intent of dedicating the image but in that dedicatory ceremony there is a pronouncement that was to go forth in connection to this image and the, the, the declaration was that everyone when they hear the music was to bow down and worship this image the consequence of not obeying this command was also pronounced to all it said you will be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire in verse 6 so it happens that during this gathering of dedication when the instruments were sounded all the peoples nations and people of every language fell down and worshiped the golden image at least that's what verse 7 gives us an indication of as the text continues we find out that there were some people that exempted themselves from this practice commanded by the king right we find that out in the in the next set of verses this 8 through 12 gives us this indication right um, if we read verse 8 it says it says for this reason of the time seven Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews they responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king O king live forever you O king have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn food lie trigon psaltery and backpipe and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image but whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of the furnace of blazing fire and then in verse 12 he says that there are certain jews whom you have appointed you king you appointed them over the administration of the province of babylon namely shadrach meshach and abednego we have their names these men O king, they have disregarded you they do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up um so we come to the charge against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've looked at this golden image that the king has set up. He's called his, his, um, his men, um, and there has been a pronouncement of what the people are supposed to be doing in connection to this image. You have to bow down and worship when they hear the sound of the music. But the charge is being brought against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why? Because they disregarded this instruction as has been given by the king to bow down and worship the golden image. The Chaldeans who brought charges against Daniel's three friends were nobles. They were not astrologers. Uh, the Aramaic term makes this very clear. They were in a position, it is suggested by some commentators, that these men were in a position um to personally profit from the execution of these three jews perhaps even to step into the government positions that these men occupied again the text does not tell us verbatim that this was the motive behind that but it's probable when we look at you know uh, the story of esther for instance and we see haman right this would not be an, a very new theme um that 
the people of God tend to suffer um, some of these kinds of things out of jealousy and envy uh, because of the positions that they hold. Um, they are being forced into very difficult circumstances. It could be that that is what was happening. Regardless, it could just be men who were devoted to their nation's religion and had vowed an allegiance to their kin and had seen men that were in contravention to what had been stated. They had seen these three Hebrew men in defiance of what the king had decreed and they could not stand it they had to rush to the king and tell him what was happening the charge was disregarding the king's command concerning pledge and allegiance by bowing before the image this constituted proof that the three jews did not worship the king's god and were not loyal to him and that's very interesting right um, without trying to draw too much correlation between their day and their time and hours, sometimes you cannot help but notice how sometimes the culture and the leaders of our day try to impose some of these things um, by way of policies, by way of instructions, vaccines, all of these kinds of things, wavy road, you know, wave versus road, all, all of these kinds of things um, can in some sense be seen from a Christian's perspective as efforts on the part of leaders in our current day and time to sort of get Christians amongst other people to conform to the ways in which these leaders have dreamt about and what the whole populace to fall in line with. That was not different from what these men experienced. In situations like this, no crime is greater than nonconformity. In situations like this, no crime is more higher than nonconformity. Yet this is what is exactly required of us by God. God asks us of when the things of this world are arrayed against the things of God. In Romans 12, Paul, after he had finished laying down a solid doctrinal foundation, declares in the first two verses, he beseeches the people of God uh, to present their bodies as living sacrifices such as a holy uh, living sacrifices that are acceptable to God. And then he petitions us not to be conformed to the spirit of the age, to be conformed to this world. Rather, he urges us to be renewed in our mind, in our thinking, to, in order to know God's will, that which is perfect, that which is acceptable, that which is the good will of God concerning his people. This charge is still relevant to us today to not be conformed to the spirit of the age, to not be conformed to the things that the culture begins to probe and throw at us and shove down our throats. But we are to be steadfast, unmovable, unshaken, having renewed our minds with a commitment to the will and purposes of God. And that is what was uh, before these men. Um, it's interesting because there is, there is an absence of Daniel in this chapter. And the absence of a reference to Daniel uh, has raised questions. Uh, had he worshipped the image? Was he away on government business? Was he occupied with pressing issues? Or was he ill and unable to attend the ceremony? Did he enjoy such an exalted position or such favor with the kin that these Chaldeans dared not accuse him. <coughs> Excuse me. The writer did not explain this mystery. There is no explanation given to why he's absent. It was a response of Daniel's three Hebrew friends that was on display. It seems safe then to assume that if Daniel had been present, he would have responded just as his three Hebrew friends had. If precedence is anything to go by with what they had experienced in chapter 1, what they had experienced in chapter 2, their, their sole reliance on God, 
it is safe to say that if Daniel was in was was even in the picture, he would have very much taken the same route that these three Hebrew men had done. It is also vital for us to remember while we're entertaining this question of why is Daniel not in the picture? Why is he not around? It's vital for us to remember that God does not test all of his children at the same time. Nor does he test each of his children in the same manner. And I think that that is very instructive for us, again, from a scriptural point of view, accepting that the scripture, thank you, is sufficient. What the, what the author puts before us um, is what we have to give emphasis to and draw the truths that are in these texts given to us and live our lives um, in alignment with that, right? So we move on. We've now seen the image that had been given by the, by the king and instructed the people to worship this, this old image. We've seen um, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego defied this instruction. The Chaldeans were not happy about that. They've gone to the king. They've um, complained to the king. Now we're going to see what the reaction of the king to this complaint and what the response of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is going to be. Um, in verses 13 through 18, the text tells us, Then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and anger gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, food, light, dragon, sautry, and backpipe, and all the kinds of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And that God, and what God is there who can deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So, Nebuchadnezzar reacted to the news of the three Jew, uh, Jews um, in a very angry fashion. The text says he was enraged. He was angry. What? These men did not bow when they heard the music. Bring them to me. He evidently took their disobedience as a personal affront as well as an act of insubordination. Nevertheless, he controlled himself. We see that he seemed to have calmed himself down once these men were before him to some extent. Um, he controlled himself sufficiently to give them a second chance to obey and restated the punishment of, for disobedience. The king distinguished between serving his gods and worshipping his golden image. There has been that distinction between serving his gods and serving the golden image. Um, this confirms that the worship of the image was primarily political than religious. However, failure to worship reflected this belief in the king's gods, which was evidence of these Jews' lack of cooperation in things, uh, in, in the things that were um, from the kingdom of B Babylon. One of the things that really struck me as I was studying this text and even reflecting on the previous chapters that we've given consideration, the, the close connection between politics and religion. You, you, you can't help but notice this close connection between politics and religion. And a lot of the time you would have politicians, you have leaders who have either come out as monarchs or have been voted into power that would make policies, form laws, and it may appear from their, st from their standpoint to be a political move, but very much embedded almost inextricably to these laws are religious connotations to the very laws that they make. And we can go in time and, you know, in very recent times, some, some of these things that have happened, right? But 
I, I was just. Can I make a comment? Yes. Just real quick. Well, because both affect our belief system. They right? do. Whether, whether politicians realize it or not, they are affecting the way people believe. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a very that's that that's a very good point. The the, the laws that people make, um, that the leaders and politicians make, uh, are very much fundamental to our beliefs. Um, and that's why it's important for us to be able to be wary of the laws that people make. Uh, but beyond that, I believe that it also calls us as believers to then keep praying for our leaders, right? Because the laws and the, you know, the, the decisions that they make have direct correspondence, correlation to the way we live out our faith. Um, even though the book of Nazar had witnessed and testified to the sovereignty of Yahweh previously. Again, look, in chapter 2, he himself testified to the sovereignty of God, having been able to reveal through Daniel his dream as well as its interpretation. In Daniel 2, 47, he, he declares, he clearly did not believe that even, even he could save the accused. Because listen to what he says in verse 15. Striking comment, <laughs> right? The very latter part of verse 15, he says, but if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And, and what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? He knew that these men were Jews. He knew that these same men were the same people he had had previous interaction, not only in chapter one, but in chapter two as well. He knew the God they served. He had seen a display of his sovereignty and his power in revealing things that were unknown. And yet, in this moment of pride and ego, he calls to question, which God is able to deliver you from my hands? Perhaps he figured that giving information was one thing, but saving people from a fiery death was another, was something requiring greater supernatural power. Right? God was able to reveal information in chapter 2, but hey, I don't think he's able to deliver you from a fiery furnace if you do not bow down and worship. Similarly, many people today believe that God inspired the Bible. But they do not believe that he can deliver them from their serious personal problems, much less world problems. There seems to be... At certain points, at certain times in our life, where we draw a certain dichotomy between what the scripture says and how much God can do in our own personal life. Like, I know that God was with David. I know he was with Daniel. He was with Paul. But this is, you know, this is the 21st century. Things have changed. You know, we have the internet. We have all of these kinds of things. Um... I don't know how much God is able to intervene in my situation. I believe that the Bible is true. And I believe that these stories are real. Um, but I don't think... I, or we don't know how much He will. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the king said himself, above all gods, none of these gods could deliver the three Hebrew boys from him. He claimed absolute authority in political and religious realms. And as we go further on in verse 16, the three young men told the king that they did not need to give an answer. The we in the text is a very emphatic one in the Hebrew. It is of, it is of a contrasting nature. We would not give you an answer, but guess who will give you an answer? God will give you an answer. God would give the king an answer. Perhaps they meant that Nebuchadnezzar should have no question about their loyalty to him. Nebuchadnezzar, at least at the point in time, should know that the loyalty of these men were not to anyone but to Yahweh. They did not, they did not need to argue about that. Surely the king knew that their faith prohibited them from worshipping any god but Yahweh. They were known to be Jews. That was the charge that was brought against them even by the Chaldeans. They said, these Jews. 
So as we journey on in verses 17 through 18, they said, these Hebrew boys said that they believed the Lord could deliver them um, from any fiery furnace and that he could deliver them. However, they also acknowledged the possibility that it might be God's will not to deliver them. And that is striking. That is fascinating. They held both sides of, of this faith, this understanding that God is able but because he is God, he can choose if in this circumstance he will. God does not always save the lives of his children when they face martyrdom. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew this, but they had no question about God's ability to save them. Whether God would deliver them or not, they refused to serve idols or bow before the king's image. And that is, I think that is the linchpin in this text for us as believers to see the faith, the character, attitude, the disposition of these men on display in the face of the most powerful man in history at the time, being captives in his own kingdom. The previous chapter, he had threatened to kill his own people, his own men, if they were not going to be able to tell him his dream. The power and authority that Nebuchadnezzar wielded was not, was not, um, these, these men were not ignorant of that power. They were very much aware. And yet, their allegiance to God was much more important to them than anything. And so we ask, we have to ask ourselves that same question when we come to this text. What is our allegiance? What is the strength of our allegiance to God? Can we then, like Paul, ask what can separate us from the love of God, from the love of Christ? A few commentators have this to say about this act from these men. The quiet, modest, yet with all very positive attitude of faith that these three men display is one of the most noblest examples in the scriptures of faith fully resigned to the will of God. These men ask for no miracle. They expect none. Theirs is the faith that says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job declared that in Job 13.15. Others went on to say, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego loved Yahweh more than life itself. Not only had they learned to recite the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, but they made it the center of their lives. For them, the will and the glory of Yahweh meant more than fame, position, or even security. Those who believe the saying, Every man has a price, should consider well the response of these men in the crisis when their lives were very much at stake. They could not be bought at any price. The catcher's but determined refusal of the Hebrews should be carefully observed. They had obeyed the powers that be as far as conscience permitted. They had made an appearance before the king when he called upon them. They journeyed to the plain of Dura. And right at the point where conscience shouted, no feather, they rejected the temptation to be arrogant in their nonconformity. As Daniel before them had been courteous in his request to follow his convictions, so these three verbally acknowledged Nebuchadnezzar as king, while committing their ultimate allegiance to the king of kings alone. Very, very striking yet instructive response by these men in the face of Nebuchadnezzar. And so we go further in the text. We've seen the image that is presented before the people, the instruction to bow down. We see the charge that is brought against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because of their defiance of this charge. We've seen the reaction of the king, which was one of rage and anger. And we've seen the response that these men have given in light of um, the window that Nebuchadnezzar gives them. We now then transition to the execution of the king's command um, in verses 19 through 23. Um, the determination of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to withhold the form of allegiance that Nebuchadnezzar required made the king as angry as it could be. 
right? He apparently ordered the furnace to be heated seven times its normal heat to make an example of them. Seven times more, um, it has been noted, is a proverbial expression for much more in some passages. We see that in Proverbs 24, 16, Proverbs 26, 16. And it may be that in this case as well, it may be, you know, uh, a proverbial expression. It does not necessarily mean that it was heated literally seven times. Let's heat it to this temperature once, heat it second time, third time, but an expression to suggest that it was heated way beyond a normal heat. Um, even if it was seven times, it doesn't change the point of the story, does it? It gives us, it still gives us this indication that it was an unusual amount of heat that these men were then to be subjected to. The fact that they were fully clothed or went thrown into the furnace will feature later in the story that the metal Persian nobles later tried to have Daniel executed in similar fashion um, before King Darius when we get to chapter 6. That the men who threw them into the fire perished is testimony to the faithfulness of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 23. Genesis 12, 20, um, Genesis 12, 3, sorry, God tells Abraham that he would bless those that bless him and he would curse those that curse him. This was the promise not just to Abraham, but to his seed. And we see a fulfillment, or at least God showing up for his people the seed of abraham in this instance when they were being faced um, with death these men the ones sending the three men into the fiery fenders were the ones that perished even before they got the chance to throw these three hebrew men into the fire and it's interesting because the text tells us that when they threw the men into the fire the ropes that with which they used in tying them up were still intact they were still bound by the ropes. Th that in itself is fascinating because if these men that were carrying these three men were consumed by the heat that was coming from the furnace and therefore died from that, the very ropes that were tying these three men could not even be, be loosened. It was still intact by the time they got into the fiery furnace. That itself is miraculous. But we do not just see that these men have been subjected to the final judgment. We see Yahweh's deliverance again in the life of his people. In verses 24 through 27, the text reads, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, what is it not, Was it not three men that were cast into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking. They're loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Right? Um, as Nebuchadnezzar watched what was happening inside the furnace, he marveled to see that the three Jews did not perish in an instant. That was his expectation. In fact, it's part of the reason why he wanted them to be fully clothed. In that way, the combustion would be very instantaneous. You have your hats on, you have your clothes on, and it's coming in contact with fire. Almost immediately, you will be set on fire. And yet, these, th that was not what happened. Rising from his seat, he saw them loosed from their bonds and walking around inside the furnace. What startled him even more was the presence of a fourth person with them. The fourth person had an unusual appearance. The text tells us, like a son of God. The king probably meant that this fourth person appeared to be superhuman or divine from his viewpoint as a pagan polytheist. Evidently, the fourth person was either an angel or an angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ. He was with the three men in their affliction and protected them from harm in the fire. He did not deliver them from the fire, 
but he delivered them while they were in the fire. And if there is anything we can deduce from that by way of applying it to our own lives, it is this fact that the Lord doesn't always prevent certain things from happening in our own life. You ask the question, I'm a faithful Christian. Why did my son have to get shot by some crazy guy that walked into the school? Why did my son have to drown? Why did my husband have to die of this sickness? Why did my finances have to go um, in, in such disarray even when I've been faithful to, you know, in serving God and giving to his church? And you, you can come up with all kinds of questions. Why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to me? The disposition of the scripture, as it ought to be our disposition, is this, that God does not deliver us every time from these things, but he is every time with us in all of those circumstances. There is no circumstance in which God is not with us. He makes sure to be with us in every situation. And we can very well know and feel that God is with us by virtue of the perspective that we hold. And it is our belief, our trust, that as we go through such texts like this, that our minds will be renewed to this truth, regardless of what comes my way, regardless of what I go through in life, regardless of what happens to me, I know this truth for a fact, that God loves me, and He cares for me, and He is with me, because His word is true. That was the disposition of these three young men. They knew that their God was able, and yet they knew that he had in his power to choose when he would deliver them or how he will orchestrate the circumstances. <sighs> Nebuchadnezzar then drew as close to the large draw of the furnace as he could. It stood open to provide a view on the inside. He called to the three victims to come out of the furnace, and they responded obediently this time. The fourth person disappeared as he had appeared. The king described, this is interesting, the king then described Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as what? The servants of the Most High God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Wouldn't it be interesting, wouldn't it be wonderful for that to be said about us, right? Having gone through all the vicissitudes of this life and being faithful in every chapter and every turn, for someone, people to be able to observe our lives and say that, Tim, servant of the Most High God, whatever your name is, servant of the Most High God, you truly are a servant of the God that you claim to believe in. This title for God appears 13 times in the book of Daniel alone. The only other book that has a larger count than the book of Daniel, can you guess what book it is? The book of Psalms, right? Seven times Nebuchadnezzar used it to describe God. Nebuchadnezzar used this title to describe God seven times. Or Daniel used it in speaking of God to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel used it twice when speaking to Belshazzar about Nebuchadnezzar. It occurs four times in chapter 7, Daniel's vision of the four beasts, three times in the words of the interpreting angel, and once by Daniel. With this title, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, ascribed greater power to the God than to any other. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. He had obviously delivered them as they said he could. And the leaders of the Babylonian Empire had witnessed the miracle. And so very finally, we now see the consequence of God's deliverance in verses 28 through 30. It reads, Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up the bodies, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own king. Imagine Nebuchadnezzar saying this. <laughs> it's interesting. Therefore, I make a decree that any people 
nation or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their house is reduced to a rubbish heap in as much as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Finally, in verse 30, then the king called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. Very fascinating end. Very contrasting end. If you look at the beginning of this text, it's a little fickle, right? yes, if you don't worship this exactly, you don't burn. exactly. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah, it tells you the pride and the ego of the man, yeah. <laughs> how much power he was filled with. Nebuchadnezzar's acknowledgement of Yahweh's superior power was an advance upon his earlier tribute to Yahweh's ability to reveal mysteries in chapter 2. The pagans believed that the gods used messengers to carry out their will. Evidently, the king viewed the fourth person in the furnace as a messenger from Yahweh. This deliverance made Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego God, Shadrach and Abednego's God superior to all others in Nebuchadnezzar's eyes. He had to acknowledge Yahweh's sovereignty over his own God, even Nebo, in this respect. Therefore, he issued a decree ordering everyone to respect Yahweh and to say nothing against him. The other thing is this, Nebuchadnezzar's ability to cancel one of his laws and replace it with another is an evidence of the might of his personal power. You know, when we looked at chapter 2, the declaration about the Babylonian kingdom being powerful like no other nation that will come after it. This is one of the things that set Babylon apart from the Medo Persians. Because the thing is this, the rulers of the Medo Persian Empire, which replaced the Babylonian Empire, could not do this. It was impossible for them to override a previous written law. We see that in chapter 6, verse 8. We see that even in Esther in chapter 1, verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar made Judaism a recognized religion with rights to toleration and respect, at the very least. His edict may have been responsible in part for the fairly comfortable conditions under which the Israelites lived during their Babylonian exile. This chapter began with Nebuchadnezzar intending to unite his kingdom under one religion. But it ends with him acknowledging Yahweh's sovereignty and permitting his worship. This does not necessarily mean, of course, that Nebuchadnezzar abandoned his pagan polytheism and cast himself wholly on Yahweh in saving faith. Although some commentators may argue that. Um, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly convinced that, that the text gives us any indication of that sort. This historical incident seems to have prophetic significance as well. right? In the coming tribulation, a Gentile ruler, we're told in chapter 7, verse 8, will demand for himself the worship that belongs to God. Revelation 13 also gives us um, this indication. Any who refuse to acknowledge his right to receive worship will be killed. Assuming political and religious power, he will oppress Israel. Most of the people in the world, including many in Israel, will submit to and worship him. But a small remnant in Israel, like, in, like the three in Daniel's day, will refuse. Many who will not worship the Antichrist will be severely punished. Many will be martyred for their faithfulness to Jesus Christ. But a few will be delivered from those persecutions by the Lord Jesus at his second return. In the forthcoming tribulation period, God will do for this believing remnant what he did for Daniel's three companions. They withstood the decree of the king, and though they were not exempted from suffering and oppression, they were delivered out of it by the God in whom they trusted. And so perhaps we can conclude by saying that this chapter advances the revelation in the preceding ones. Previously, God had revealed himself as the only God who can reveal mysteries, things previously unknown, but now made clear to him. The image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in this dream and that Daniel interpreted in chapter 2 was a revelation of the future world kingdoms and their characteristics. Chapter 3 shows that Yahweh is powerful enough to control history miraculously. He does so to remain true to his promises to his people and to deliver those who put their trust in him. He can review the future, but he can also bring it into existence. Chapter 2 demonstrates the wisdom of God. Chapter 3 at least shows us the power of God. The most powerful man at the time, Nebuchadnezzar, witnessed the power of Yahweh, who not only exists out of time, but controls time itself. 
Thus, there should be no question about the Lord's greatness. There's a lot that we can take away from this, um, one of which would be um, the delusion that political leaders can have when they are in power. We do not have to be um, cowarded. We don't have to uh, shy away from the traditions and the truths that we know have inherited from the scriptures. We have to stand true to them in faithful obedience to the God who's called us. These three Hebrew boys are an example to us, for us, in how to respond whilst living in a wicked culture led by a wicked ruler being influenced by all kinds of evil things. It's all around us. Um, it's everywhere we go. And yet we've been called to be faithful while we are in this world. We are not of this world, and yet we are in this world. And we trust that our good God who's called us and has been so gracious to save us by the finished work of his son and has given you and I his spirit to be resident in us will give us grace to be able to live in this life while we still await his glorious return. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for the time that you have given to us to be able to give consideration to this text in Daniel 3. It is such a rich text. And if anything stands out to us, it is that you are a faithful God. You are a powerful God. Even when we are unfaithful, Lord, you are faithful. Thank you for this reminder this morning. We pray that we will not be influenced by our life circumstances. Lord, give us the courage and the strength to not give in to the culture and to the spirit of this age. We pray that you will shorten the time of your coming in order that even the elect will be spared. We pray that as we wait for you to return again, may we be found faithful in the work of the kingdom. And while we are doing that, we pray that may the name of Christ be exalted higher than ever before. May the message of the gospel be blazed abroad and may the Spirit convict the hearts of men of sin and may it bring them to saving knowledge of the one true Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We commit the rest of our day into your hands, O oh God. We ask that as we transition to the main service, we ask that our hearts will be prepared to receive your word. We pray that the lost will be saved today by the preaching of the gospel. We pray that your people will be further sanctified by the hearing of the truth of your word. Thank you for everything that you've done for us and all that you're yet to do. We ask all this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.